Good afternoon and welcome to our session on exploring low carbon and energy efficient procurement as a tool for Paris Agreement implementation. So I will be the moderator for this session. I'm Jelly Molino, consultant for UNEP and SPP and procurement advisor for UNOPS. So actually this is very challenging on our part because we know that procurement really is not a mainstream a topic when it comes to climate change. So it's really a struggle, a struggle for people working on procurement to really promote the importance of the work that we do in addressing our, our problem. Nonetheless, we are very fortunate that there are a lot of, of people who think that this is really very important. And for this particular session, I will be introducing our speakers, we have two. One is, of course, uh, George Mark Sainer, who has always been our chair every time we had a session in Climate Law and Governance Day in, in terms of procurement. He is based in, in um, Switzerland. Uh, of course, he, he can be here in person, but definitely supportive of all the works that are really uh, on, on promoting the importance of procurement as an economic tool to uh, address uh, sustainability issues, more particularly on procurement. And of course, I'm very fortunate that we have a new partner in terms of this particular advocacy, the CMS uh, law firm, an international law firm that is also advancing so much on the promotion of energy efficiency and promotion of sustainability. And of course, they are supporting a lot of clients, so it's very new on our part because we used to work only on, on the public sector. So we're very fortunate that our second chair who is here in person is of course, um, attorney Monir Hassan, which is the manager of the CMS law firm. And then of course, we have very um, high profile personalities who will be sharing what has been done in terms of promoting procurement as a strategic tool to address climate change. We'll start, of course, from the international perspective. And we'll know that UNOPS is one of the prime mover in terms of the international organization and advancing sustainable procurement. And we are very fortunate that our procurement director, um, and Claire Howard, is here with us online um, from Copenhagen, of course, to support us. And with, with uh, the other speakers that we have, we have from the Ministry of, of um, um, from Netherlands, we have a very uh, good speaker also, is Mariker Weatherheisim. So she has been supporting the importance of pr promoting sustainability in ICT. For a lot of sessions in this particular conference, we talk about the importance of technology. But when we are discussing about technology, are we also discussing about how are we procuring technology? Because that is very important, not just the role of technology per se in addressing uh, climate change, but how are we procuring this technology that is supposed to address um, climate change? So we will learn from the experience of, of Netherlands. And of course, um, another, another person from Netherlands is the ICT advisor himself who will talk about the technicalities because of, of course, this is a, a, a new field on how to procure um, climate resilient technology specifically in, in, in terms of government contracting. So we have also another speaker, um, John Rodem Haas, I'm sorry, it's so difficult to, to pronounce name. But then again, you see, it is important for us to understand what do the governments uh, are doing? What do what governments are doing in terms of promoting sustainability in their in their procurement? And we are very fortunate, of course, the two of championing this particular field are present uh, with us online. One, of course, is the CEO. Congratulations, because now the. Uh, um, Center Pur uh, Purchasing Technology uh, uh, Unit of the Bangladesh Republic has been changed to Public Procurement Authority, which means that they are given more responsibility to make sure that procurement will be used strategically. The CEO, we have um, Mr. Muhammad Shavir Ramon Chaudhary. I've been working with, with him for a, a couple of times in, in Bangladesh. And of course, the other person that is really very focused also in terms of promoting sustainability and government contracting is a representative 
from the government of Mauritius. We know that Mauritius is, is one of the countries that is also vulnerable to climate change. So what, what uh, does countries similar to Mauritius are doing in using its purchasing power to achieve its NDCs? And of course, we have to also understand that this is not something that is being done by those working in the government, by those working in the judiciary, by those working in the private sector, but also the important role of academics, important role of the university, important role of students. We are very fortunate to have students here. So I would like also to thank uh, Professor Christopher Yukins, who will be here to support us in this particular uh, discussion. So without further ado, I'm giving the floor to our chairman, uh, Judge Mark. The floor is yours to introduce the first session. Thank you. Mark, are you, are you there? Um, Mark, you're muted. No, it's not there. It's on stage. Judge, Judge Mark, is, is, is he there? Mark Sayers. Is he in the waiting room? Kevin Roy? Let's move to the speakers from that yes. session. Okay. Maybe he has technical issues. Yeah, maybe a uh, judge is, is, is having a technical issue. I'm, I'm sorry for, for that. We'll go back to um, him. So let's start the, the first issue that we are supposed to discuss. How can the government purchasing power of 14% GDP in high income countries and 30% of GDP in developing countries accelerate the demand strategy for more climate friendly procurement system? And we have here two um, speakers who will be discussing on, on this particular issue. Let me give the floor to um, um, Anne. Anne, can you take over? And yes, of course. <laughs> the importance of procurement. Good, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to try and give this very important topic the introduction that it deserves. Um, this is a topic that's very close to my heart, so I, I'm briefly going to touch on the strategic nature of procurement, which uh, we all understand in this forum, but which others may not. Uh, then what can be done more specifically in, in the construction sector and, and recent initiatives in this space? So first of all, public procurement is a key driver for market transformation. Uh, as we've said, it accounts for up to 30% of GDP, depending on where you are. This basically represents trillions of dollars of spending, which can be leveraged to positively impact climate through sustainable decisions. Now, this has to be supported by the right policies, the right practices that enable choices that would prioritize more sustainable goods and services. And I know that throughout this session, we'll focus on specific examples from a couple of countries. Now, under SDG 12, uh, Target 12.7 promotes public procurement practices that are sustainable. This is a very clear target and highlights that public procurement is actually central to achieving sustainable development. And I think it's high time that we all recognize that procurement is a fundamental part of addressing sustainability, including climate change. Now, governments can and must use public procurement as a strategic tool that has to be the central decision point. But it also has to become central to their national development plans. But I think, and this is a really important point, we need to recognize the different levels of maturity that governments have in this space. But even more importantly, I think, recognize the different levels of maturity of the markets in which they operate. You're not going to look at this in the same way if you're in Mauritius, for example, as you would in the Netherlands. You're not dealing with the same market players. You're not dealing with the same constraints. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do anything, but the mechanisms you'll use and the tools will be different because the space in which you're operating is different. So what we need to look at is in countries, especially those most affected by climate change, public procurement has to be connected to development strategies so it can actually deliver better value and better outcomes. This requires working with the market, so to enable your local suppliers to start meeting basic sustainability requirements. It can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. And this is the challenge with discussions like this one, is we can share best practice and examples, 
but a one size fits all approach will not deliver what we want it to do. I think that what we need to look at is how impactful the sustainable procurement practices can be. Now, if you look at the global strategy on sustainable consumption and production, which was developed under the 10 year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production, this recognizes circularity and sustainable public procurement as key enab enablers for change in high impact sectors. Now, what are we talking about in terms of high impact sectors? And I'm gonna focus on one specific one because when it comes to climate change, this has a double relevance and this is the construction sector. So there's a lot of data I could share. I'm not gonna give you all the numbers, but just picking a few key ones. First of all, construction is about 11 to 13% of global GDP. Uh, it consumes almost 50%, five zero, of the total material footprint ac across the global economy which contributes heavily to global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if you look at this, the trends, both in terms of resource use and the impacts, this is only expected to intensify. Projections are that 50% of the buildings that will exist in 2050 have not been yelled, built yet. This is a huge number. So what does this mean for sustainable public procurement? Well, this is an enabler of market transformation in the construction sector. Many countries, especially those affected by climate change, will be spending significant amount of public procurement expenditure on building infrastructure. And national and local governments will play a key role in steering the transformation of this sector. Now, there's many examples as to how governments and development agencies or the UN are putting in place policies and frameworks to enable sustainable construction. And many focus on design and what type of infrastructure we should build. But public procurement policies and decisions can significantly contribute to a number of things. You can reach carbon and circularity targets for building less or building better. Public procurement can encourage innovation through reuse, repurposing, modular approach, low, low carbon approach or circular approaches. You can look at alternative materials or even traditional techniques. It can also foster decarbonization by encouraging resource efficiency, resilience, and even social inclusion through whole life cycle assessments and disclosure standards. And I think one of the key things here is construction materials are set to dominate resource consumption, especially in fast growing developing economies. And this means that associated GHG emissions are expected to double by 2060. Now, there's a lot of sessions at COP. I've looked at the program and I know a lot of them are happening. And I, I would encourage all of you who are there in person or online to encourage them to attend some of these sessions on construction materials, because there's a lot happening in this space. And as public procurement agents, we have a role to play in this. So in closing, because I'm conscious we have little time, what are we doing? Um, well, UNOPS has developed many tools, sustainability criteria, policies to enable sustainable procurement in the projects we deliver for our partners. But more specifically in the construction place, we're a partner of the One Planet Network. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. If you're not, uh, you can find links quite easily. One of the programs run by the One Planet Network is the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, uh, more commonly known as the Global ABC. Now, we work very closely with UNEP on this, and we look at how to support governments and the private sector in their efforts to upscale circularity standards and practices in the construction se sector. So one of the flagship initiatives, and I'm going to do a shameless plug for it here, is mainstreaming circularity in the construction sector through public procurement. This is a joint initiative between the One Planet Network, a Sustainable Public Procurement Program, and the Global ABC where we're looking at how we can accelerate circularity and construction through public procurement. We want to engage, collaborate, support national and local governments in their efforts to accelerate the uptake of these circularity standards, uh, to help them use planning, managing and purchasing power to apply a whole life cycle approach. This is really around promoting a balanced approach to shifting public demand towards circularity in the construction sector. Um, now, the process of developing this initiative is in its initial stages, which is why one of the things I'm doing here is, is trying to encourage participation in this. There's a stock taking exercise taking place, looking at stakeholder mapping, baseline studies, 
and we're looking at how we can build partnerships in this space. So there will be many webinars organized in 2024 to support this, but we do welcome interested participants to join the initiatives. So please uh, see this as a, as a shameless pitch to encourage more participation, because the more nations participate, the more players we have involved in this, the more likely it is to be effective. Now, I'm aware I've taken more than enough time uh, today, but I'll leave you with this parting comment. If you're in Dubai, uh, you're more than welcome to go to the UNOPS Pavilion, where we do have a running exhibition on purchasing for impact. So I know we don't often talk about public procurement in climate-led uh, sessions, but I think this is a great opportunity to see how we've been operationalizing sustainable procurement, and it'll show you some of the tools we've developed. But I'm really excited to have this discussion today, and I agree with the Jelly's initial comments. We don't talk about procurement in the climate space enough, and I think this is a great opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So before we go into the discussion, let's proceed to the next speaker and learn about what the US is doing. Professor Yukins, the floor is yours. You are on mute. Thank you very much for your kind invitation, Shelley. I'm very glad to join this panel. This, is, this has been quite interesting to participate in. I'm going to give a quick review of what the federal government is, is doing from the U.S. perspective. My name is Chris Eukins. I'm a professor in the Government Procurement Law Program at George Washington University Law School in Washington, D.C. Um, the Biden administration has been very aggressive in moving forward in sustainable procurement strategies, which is very important in the U.S. market. Federal government procurement policy and have a direct impact on over 8% of our GDP, both directly through federal procurement, which amounts to approximately $700 billion a year, and also through federal grants policy. When the federal government grants monies to state and local and tribal governments, they those grants typically carry requirements on procurement, on when procurement is done using those federal grants, and those grants amount to approximately $1.2 trillion a year. So taking together these two pathways for federal procurement policy, federal sustainability policy in procurement could be quite effective in the U.S. marketplace. The U.S. government has joined the Net Zero Government Initiative, and the Biden administration has advanced several actions to further that initiative. I want to talk about what the Biden administration has done. Um, this, this policy strategy has been in, in gestation for approximately 15 years since the Obama administration. I want to talk first about what the Biden administration done and what it hasn't done, but, get, but we can predict where it's likely to go in the future. So the four initiatives that are in play right now is the first one is requiring major federal um, suppliers to disclose, to publicly disclose emissions and set reduction targets. This initiative would center on contractor qualification, which we know is responsibility, contractor responsibility in the United States. Under a proposed rule published in November 2022, to be considered qualified or to be considered responsible, major federal contractors, those with over $50 million in annual federal obligations, would be required to publicly report their annual corporate level GHG admissions and set targets to reduce them. So this first strategy turns on contractor qualification or contractor responsibility. The next is launching a buy clean initiative for low carbon materials. This initiative pr promotes purchase of low carbon materials in the construction industry. So it's an initiative focused on particular materials in a particular industry. In February 2022, the Biden administration launched its federal buy clean initiative and task force that will promote the use of construction materials with lower Im embedded emissions and pollutants across the life cycle. The third initiative is to change federal procurement rules to minimize the risk of climate change, including factoring the social cost of greenhouse gas, or SCGHG, in procurement decisions. So this is an initiative focused on risk reduction. It's part of a, a broader strategy you see across the, the procurement community, really worldwide. The OECD highlighted in, in a June 2023 report on risk management public procurement. This is taking that risk management concept and applying it into the issue of um, sustainability. So this particular initiative seeks to require agencies to consider life cycle costs of sustainable alternatives. They're already required under a federal acquisition regulation to consider life cycle costs. In this case, they're going to be considering sustainable alternatives as part of that planning process. So it's it's life cycle cost in the assessment in the planning process. That's what this is focused on. The Biden administration says that it aims to strengthen life cycle cost approaches to include the SCGHG 
the incremental future economic damages caused by each ton of carbon pollution, which can be a valuable tool to guide agencies toward investments that are compatible with the low carbon economy of the future. Um, the materials I'm speaking from today are on my blog and publicprocurementinternational.com, publicprocurementinternational.com. And there you can see references to that there is a proposed rule being drafted and we're waiting for it to be published with regards to this particular initiative on the assessment of life cycle cost and the assessment of uh, risk. The last initiative is maximizing the procurement of sustainable, excuse me, the third initiative is maximizing the procurement of sustainable products and services, which stresses the use of approved eco-label products, uh, products that are with particular eco-labels that are approved by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And this, the, the proposed rule has been published that would revamp our FAR Part 23 to identify and call for agencies wherever practical to purchase these eco-label pro eco products. The last is to establish a net zero emissions procurement federal leaders working group, including a buy clean task force. So this is an initiative focused on leadership. So what you've seen here are initiatives focused on contractor qualification, on specifying low carbon products and a specific in the construction industry, on eco labels and on leadership. All of these bundled together focus, uh, point towards what was already identified in 2010 by in the Obama administration as the ultimate core goal here in federal procurement, which is to be able to assess the incremental um, greenhouse gas emissions attributable to, to a particular good or service, to actually be able to take greenhouse gas emissions into account when weighing whether or not to buy a particular good or service, to be able to make it part of the calculus in the procurement. All these pieces have to be in place. The, 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 the contractors have to chronicle what their greenhouse gas emissions are. That's what the first initiative is about. You, we have pilots in specific industries where we focus on low carbon goods. We, the eco labels will become an important complement to all this as a shortcut for identifying those products that are most sustainable. And you also need very strong leadership. So all these four initiatives together point towards what we as Americans would call a brass ring, the brass ring of actually being able to assess when you're evaluating a particular good and service, what kind of damage it would cause the climate. And that's where we hope to be 10 or 20 years from now. There may be some um, political turbulence before we get to that point, but we can certainly see that on the horizon. Joey, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yukin. So Judge Mark is already here. So um, can we hear from Judge Mark? So how can we use public procurement as a climate tool? Based, of course, on the 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 sharing from the UNOPS and, of course, from the U.S. experience, that fits perfectly well. Because what is really important to know is how we can make out of public procurement a climate policy tool. The pity is that public procurement is considered to be something interested only for specialized specialists and technocrats. And this is not true. This is an issue that should interest us all because it's a huge lever of, or if you would like it in UK English, lever to make the world different. I mean, these 30 trillion of investment in the public sector supply chain, I mean, this is an enormous amount of money. The next slide, please. And if you look, at it, what you can make out of it, it comes to economy, it comes to law, it comes to how can we do the economy design. And this is especially true this year, because 2023, we had an International Trade Center webinar, including the representative of WTO, Reto Malakrida, saying, hey, GPA can be used as a green public procurement tool. And this is new. Also, the director general of the WTO, her statements on that topic are new. So let's take this opportunity and the next slide, please. So why is this particularly important? Enterprises can live with the idea, the business of business is business, and purpose, if they want to have some, it's fine, but they need necessarily. But the public sector is driven by purpose and collecting money is, in addition to that, also necessary 
but the purpose is at core of public sector activities. And that's why the public sector is called to have a role model in this, to act as a role model. And if we can unleash this concept as a tool to reinvent the future, then there will be a real change. And that's what we're looking for, real transformation. That might serve as an introduction, perhaps, Jelly, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark and our experts. Uh, may we ask our team from CMS if you have some um, um, comments on the discussion, like in your perspective, how would you see the uh, private sector responding to this particular assessment that procurement can be used as a, as a tool for? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the private sector has an issue with it. I think what the private sector always cares about more than anything is clarity. So knowing that um, the rules that are being applied and achievability so that the, you know, the requirements being set are not somehow picking winners and losers, but actually are achievable by a sufficient number of bidders. And if that's possible, then the procurement rules are usually a good mm -hmm. vehicle for achieving other objectives too. But Donna, I don't know whether you have. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, we will touch upon it, I think, a bit later too. But for me, uh, embedding really into procurement, um, uh, so to say green procurement criteria also uh, helps those companies who are already champions, who are investing already a lot, right? Just uh, because they believe in this transition, they believe that this, this is a necessity for them to exist in 10 to 20 years, right? But still investment is comes with a lot of cost. And if they are prioritized by these procurement uh, uh, procurement uh, strategies right and would be so to say awarded then they would get a return on their investment they did already and this would help them with the competition because this is something we hear a lot from businesses they say where is the regulator to help us like to lay the playing field right to help us to get this return well in our investment what we are already doing right Okay, and that will lead us to the second question. Maybe it's better for us, okay, to introduce please the second session in terms of what is really happening in, in, in the field. So we're very fortunate that we have here on the ground on, on our session representative from the Netherlands that are really piloting on how they are doing um, sustainable procurement in the ICT sector. So I give the floor now to uh, Marike. So Thank you, Jelly. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here today. Um, and um, building on, on what Anne Claire and, and Mark were sharing earlier, um, how uh, procurers can really take a step um, to, um, to help drive uh, sustainability and market transformation. That's exactly what we're also aiming for with the Circular and Fair ICT Pact. Um, next slide, please. And it may be um, a little bit of a surprise to people that we're talking about ICT here. Um, but in fact, the ICT sector, um, in terms of climate impact, surpasses that of the aviation industry. And um, as Jelly was also saying, with the drive to um, uh, digitalization and digital solutions to many problems globally, the impact of ICT is growing rapidly. And um, with, with that in mind, and also um, keeping in mind that we all have a role to play um, to help uh, change the situation. Uh, also, as procurers and consumers of ICT, uh, the Circular and Fair ICT Pact was launched back in 2021 as an international partnership that aims to accelerate sustainable production and use of circular and fair ICT products worldwide through the power of procurement. Um, currently, we have uh, participants in over 10 countries with uh, Slovenia uh, joining yesterday at the COP. So we're really pleased um, to also be able to share a little bit more at the COP through this presentation. Um, and um, we're actually aiming for what the what, what our hosts from CMS were, were talking about. Um, looking at how we can uh, harmonize the procurement ask internationally um, to drive that harmonized change. Next slide, please. 
Um, so what does circular and fair procurement for CFIT look like? Um, what is quite important to realize is that for ICT, 80% or for many ICT products, I should say, about 80% or more of the climate impacts are associated with the production stage and not what many people uh, think in the use phase. That means that um, even though procurement is a really important uh, tool um, to use to address cl uh, climate impacts, it's also really critical as a procuring organization to think about the stages prior to the tender and after the tender. So thinking about how we can buy less products and use products longer will, will really help um, making big changes towards the climate impacts. Um, and then again, uh, also there are loads of opportunities um, to procure in a way that really supports climate impacts. Um, uh, in a positive way. And I would like to give the floor to my colleague Johan, who will explain how the Netherlands have, um, well, translated the Paris Agreement into practice in their ICT procurement. All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any slides. Yet. I think I should. Johan, if you if you scroll the the speaker bar above uh, your own screen, you can see uh, a window with the slides. Scroll speaker bar. Up. I don't see anything. Well, <clears throat> gonna start anyway. Um, <laughs> I think what slide you're now seeing is probably the one from category IT hardware. That's yeah, right, yes. yes. Yeah, perfect. Then I'll uh, go to this one. Um, so uh, I'm a strategic sustainability advisor for the category IT hardware. So uh, we're a government wide category which um, purchases all the uh, workspace related hardware and telecommunication for the Dutch central government. So you can think about uh, laptops, smartphones, tablets, um, uh, telephone lines, standard ones, voice over IP, uh, but also some cloud uh, um, uh, cloud solutions as well, which we use for the different uh, um, different contracts. In total, we have about 100 to 130 participants in each contract, so it's quite a lot actually. It's all the ministries, um, uh, some high college of states, some advisory councils, so quite a broad set of different organizations which all buy, of course, the same type of hardware. Uh, and in total, we do about 200 million euros uh, a year in spend within our category. That sounds like a lot, but if you look at it from a market perspective or from an international perspective, it's actually not that much. Um, but we do use that, of course, to stimulate change within the supply chain and within the markets. We do that with a team of eight. We have one category manager, uh, one uh, management support, and we have four contact manager, one supply relationship manager, and me as a st specific sustainability advisor. So I focus on everything from um, the Paris Agreement all the way towards creating specific criteria into um, government contracts and government tenders. So it's quite a broad set of <laughs> broad set of things I'm always working on, but it's really nice to uh, to be able to. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how do we use like uh, the, the policies on an international level? How do we translate it all the way into the mini tenders? So of course we look at uh, the policy elements like the Paris Agreement, European legislation, but also then looking at a national level to the Dutch Climate Agreement and also, uh, for example, the National Circular Economy Program. Um, that's translated again into like procurement with impact, which is a policy we have within the Dutch government, which applies to, to the whole government. Uh, which is ambitious and identifies specific product or services groups which have a high impact on uh, the business operations within the business operation of the Dutch government. And we have some specific targets as well within it. So we want to have climate neutral business operations in 2030 uh, and 50% less critical raw materials, for example, also in 2030. Well, we have a, then we have a broad set of of course, policy aspects we put into place, we translate that actually in the category plan, which is specifically for our markets and product groups. So we identify like the uh, the teams which have the highest impact and we create strategies specifically for specific tenders uh, within our category. So we 
our category splits up our tenders mostly on operating systems. So we have Android devices, or we have Windows operated devices, we have desktops or printers, stuff like that. And what we do actually is for each tender, identify the specific teams we can create the highest impact on. We have a baseline and we create award criteria, which um, create even more impact based on sustainability elements. Um, and some of our contracts work with mini tenders, but we, we put all the sustainability criteria onto the framework contract. So it applies to everybody. So we create a win-win-win situation, a win for the market. So they have like uh, clarity to which direction we're heading. It's a win for our all our participants because we organize everything on a central level. So we have the sustainability expertise to help them. And a win again for the Dutch government because we realize our sustainability goals. Uh, next sheet, please. So what? how does it look like in, in, in general? If we focus on climate, well, Marika always already stated that uh, for most of our products, the impact is in the production phase. And for some of our products like cloud or data center capacity for telecom, it's more on uh, the use phase, so energy efficiency. So what we do actually for, for, for example, for hardware, we know all our footprints of all the types of hardware we buy. And we have like a yearly wrap up of how much CO2 we emitted by buying those products. We also compensate, of course, our products um, now focusing on climate neutrality. That, that's always part of the debate, of course, CO2 compensation, but it's an element which contributes to it. And, but that was only a baseline, for example, on this element. And we improved all those things already again in 2023 and updated the 2021 contract. So we now focus on, for example, like climate neutral business operations, high efficiency of data centers, but also focusing, for example, on what type of power the data centers use, uh, what type of renewable energy is preferred, uh, and how can we stimulate um, participant, oh, sorry, um, contract partners to become even more sustainable during um, the during duration of the contract. And examples are we create award criteria which they have to comply to in 12 or 24 or 36 months, depending on the ambition level which we identified. Uh, so we now have, for example, an award criteria for science-based targets for net zero within 20. Um, uh, they have to identify and validate, a near, uh, for example, a net zero target in uh, within 24 months of the start of the contract. Well, we, of course, generate a lot of data towards it. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, next sheet, please. Thank you. So what we, uh, because we, um, we get all our CO2 data, we have a good insight of how we how our CO2 emissions are aligned with uh, the targets we, uh, we identified. So you see now a graphic of um, the green bars are the targets because it's hard to read. The orange bar is the gross CO2 emissions of the workspace hardware for a uh, four-year period. And then, uh, of course, the, the blue bars are the net, uh, uh, net emissions. So we see a descending trend. I was still working on the 2022 and 2023 emissions because um, we're still figuring out how to, um, uh, well, I have to update this one uh, still. Uh, what we also see is that because we uh, require sustainability criteria, the Eco Vada scorecards, for example, go up. We also see um, a change in information feeds between manufacturers and resellers, and of course, we as an end user. So we see a lot of boosting um, of sustainability in general in the market through our tenders. So it's an, a direct effect of applying like the policy, uh, translating policy into action. Um, next slide, please, because I'm short on time, of course. And yeah. that's it. That was a wrap up. So it's a short highlight, but uh, I hope I could, gave you I gave you some insights about how we organize your discussion. And of course, coming from uh, developing countries such as the Philippines, I, I it came to my mind like, OK, those are high level assessment. Yes, it's easier done in Netherlands. But what about countries such as the Philippines? What about countries such as Bangladesh? That's why it's very important that in sessions like this, we listen from representative of those countries that are not as high income as, as Netherlands, but still they're using their purchasing power to make sure that they will be promoting sustainable procurement. And we're very happy that we have representative from the government. So let's start from Bangladesh experience. Before we do, I think we have um, Donny on the th second ah. topic first, before we go move on to the third topic as well. Oh, so yeah, I mean, there's I, no slides. So. <laughs> there are no slides. <laughs> 
I will be very, very brief and save you all time. I mean, I think the question which uh, should have uh, or was raised uh, to me was really what do we need, which are the magical ingredients, right, for a, system, a systematic framework, right? So what do we need? Where do we need to start? And what do we look at? Of course, I mean, being biased, being an attorney, I would say a robust regulation for sure, right? So you need clarity, you need transparency, you need to level the playing field, as I said, for those businesses who are already there in all of this. But uh, the most thing I would say, the most important for me, uh, the aspect, the most important aspect, what this would mean, including and integrating low carbon criteria into public procurement, it's a cultural change. And I went into so many sessions during the COP and everybody is talking about changing the mindset, right? Looking at it from a different view, changing the culture. And this whole transition needs a top-down approach and changing the procurement, right? When you as the public side say, I, I procure only if you comply with sustainability, if you comply with green and so on and so forth, you create the mind change and then change in awareness. So I think that's something which shouldn't be underestimated when we talk about green procurement. So robust regulation is key, of course. But Mark, I think Mark said that when we were preparing this session, just putting out the regulation there doesn't fix the problem, right? So you need to do, of course, more, right? You have to have uh, education, really and capacity building there. So these procurement officers need to know what they're talking about, right? What they're buying. What does this mean, sustainable procurement practice? What does mean low carbon criteria and so on and so forth to make profound decisions? And I think it was great that during this COP, education was talked everywhere, right? And addressed everywhere and capacity building was addressed everywhere. Another, of course, magic ingredient is supplier engagement, right? You have to engage with your suppliers. You have to have a clear screening criteria, right? And to see where are these uh, performances of these suppliers and to exchange information. I think that's crucial too. I remember I attended the conference or for Urban Future, it is called, and there a lot of mayors, city representatives, state representatives are coming together to discussing procurement, their best practices, how they do it, what does it mean, what does shouldn't it mean, right, and so on and so forth. I think this knowledge sharing is crucial because you learn from your failures, you learn from the successes of the others, and I think that's crucial too. Life cycle assessment, very, very important, as also uh, Professor Christopher mentioned, right? And also as it is embedded in some of the more developed regulations, life cycle assessment is crucial to see what does this whole life cycle mean when it comes to public procurement and the carbon footprint. But again, no regulation is as good as it could be if you don't implement it properly, if you don't measure properly, if you don't report properly, if you don't follow up properly, right? And see whether the award tendered and the performance you're expecting, the KPIs you have set are met, right? You have to do that in order to see whether it is working or not. And then if necessary, really do change and adapt. And the last point, which was discussed uh, uh, during the COP a lot is technology, of course, AI, innovation, right? Doing things like done uh, always like it was done before is maybe not the best attitude to overcome these challenges also du uh, during, within procurement. So thinking of new ways, innovations and so on and so forth, onboarding innovations is I think very, very crucial. And I have a long list of other things to touch upon, but I stop there and I leave it to the to the Q&A. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Dai. So again, you have, you have discuss a lot of important topics that are actually, you know, summarizing the experience of Netherlands. But the same question is here. How feasible is that, you know, that initiatives to be adopted in countries such as Bangladesh, such as the Philippines, where I came from, or such as Mauritius? So it's, let's, let's learn from their experience. So for the third issue, again, 
thank you so much for, for that discussion. We will have a lot of questions after, so we'll try to finish the speaker first, and then we'll open the floor for Q&A and discussion among the experts. So may I call our expert from Bangladesh, our CEO now, um, Muhammad DJ, I call him DJ, Muhammad Shoder Raman Chaudhary. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon uh, from Bangladesh uh, to all uh, dear participants. Uh, you know that Bangladesh is one of the worst uh, climate vulnerable countries of the world. So keeping in mind these issues, uh, government started working on the uh, climate uh, resilient issues uh, uh, in different areas and uh, public uh, procurement is not behind. So first, let me give a quick facts about the public procurement system of Bangladesh. Actually, we started our reform of public procurement in 2002 with a robust uh, legal framework consistent with uh, international good practices. We have primary legislation, secondary legislation, and also some guidelines also. In the institutional area, actually, uh, the Central Procurement Technical Unit, which has recently been transformed as Bangladesh Public Procurement Authority, is the only organization uh, of the country which is working as a guardian of the public procurement in the country. So we have only one unitary system of public procurement. Uh, that is uh, one advantage, I think, uh, in a country like us. Uh, then uh, procurement operations and market practices, uh, we have started another journey in 2011 uh, that uh, we entered into public uh, electronic public procurement system. In accountability, integrity, and transparency area also, we have oversight uh, in institutions like uh, Auditor General Office, Anti-Corruption Office, and uh, uh, this uh, competition commission office. Next slide, please. So we have uh, the fundamental document. Uh, I have mentioned there are many documents, National Sustainable Development Strategy, which we formulated, our government formulated to address the SDG issues. And uh, then uh, government felt that we need to actually formulate one sustainable public procurement policy. And uh, based on that, actually, we started uh, more than one year. We worked on it and uh, we formulated one policy. Uh, here in our country, it is uh, this uh, decentralized public procurement. So all the procuring agencies, they can prepare their uh, uh, procurement activities on their own. Next slide, please. Uh, during the preparation of this uh, sustainable public procurement policy, we have a very small consultation with our stakeholders. So some of the findings the stakeholders gave, I have uh, presented before you, that what are the barriers uh, to uh, sustainable public procurement policy, uh, lack of actually products, actually what products we will call sustainability, lack of expertise, uh, regulatory framework is not robust. Uh, so these are the things uh, they cited that actually we need to address these things for maintaining uh, or for implementing the sustainable public procurement policy in the country. Next slide, please. So how can we strengthen actually uh, sustainable public procurement po policy in our country or implement it uh, uh, across the country? Many of the issues our discussant discussed here, our experts discussed actually uh, frequent training. I mean, the capacity development is one of the most important issue. We are now trying to raise awareness in the area of public procurement because sensitization of the main stakeholders is uh, very important and motivating our employees in the public offices is also in our coming agenda. Next slide, please. As I mentioned that we have uh, formulated one sustainable public procurement policy, one detailed guideline, one action plan also, and uh, one roadmap. Actually, we want to go phase by phase. It is difficult. You understand that it's not easy for a country like us. 
So we want to learn from the developed countries like USA, like Netherlands and many other countries, actually how to proceed uh, with the agenda in coming days. It's a long journey, we understand. So uh, this is uh, some idea I try to give you about the public procurement or sustainable public procurement system in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. I will be obliged to answer any question on our public procurement system, especially on uh, SPP, uh, Sustainable Public Procurement Policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, DG. So let's now proceed to Mauritius and learn from their experience. Mr. Dabu Singh, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon from the beautiful island of Mauritius. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mauritius being a small island state, and uh, we are vulnerable, vulnerable to climate change. And a lot of initiative is being, uh, is being uh, initiated in Mauritius on, with regard to climate change. But I will focus myself on there are initiatives that's, that's being launched by the Ministry of Environment. We have two major projects, which is on, which is one, which is called the greening of the public sector. And the second one is a, 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 a report on circular economy, right? I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to focus on public procurement. Next slide, please. Uh, as you see, uh, I've heard uh, Professor uh, Yuking talking about life cycle costing. And uh, I, another speaker also talking about life cycle costing. We have in our Public uh, Procurement Act, since the very onset in 2006, uh, life cycle costing at Section 28 of the Act. But unfortunately, unfortunately, as rightly said by a speaker, you can only, you have, you have policies, but you have to implement them. And over time, we have not been able to understand uh, uh, the importance of life cycle costing as we are looking at it presently. And uh, in 2012, there was a UNEP study done in Mauritius where uh, five, uh, five uh, goods were looked at, were five procurement items like vehicles, IT equipment and accessories, paper and paper products, cleaning services and cleaning material. So we have, UNEP did the study in 2012. We have with us all the SBDs already prepared and uh, given to us. But unfortunately, these SBDs reflect the, uh, the country where the consultant came from. So now what we have done, we have started uh, uh, customizing the, cust the, the, the documents and we are already ready with the document for sustainable, procu sustainable procurement of vehicles. And uh, very soon we'll be finalizing the sustainable procurement of IT equipments and accessories. Thereafter, we'll continue to work on paper products, cleaning services, and cleaning material. And um, also, our, our budgetary measure has uh, been announced in 2022-2023 for uh, the coming up uh, with a with proper proposal for the construction sector. And I've taken note, good note of, of what other speakers have talked. You know, I think, has talked about construction sector we will follow up with them on, on construction sector. We are floating a bit for the appointment of a consultant to advise us on the construction sector, sustainable construction sector. Next slide, please. What, what we have done over time, we have uh, over the past uh, two years, since 2020 to 2022, there has been the MAPS assessment, the methodology for assessing the public procurement system of Mauritius. It's the second assessment based on the latest version of MAPS. And uh, these, uh, this tool, as you know, uh, comes up with a number of recommendations. And four of the main ones are, they have found that the complex procurement legal framework, there is insufficient alignment and consistency between the Public Procurement Act, the Public Procurement Regulation, and the electronic procurement system, which we have since 2015. The provision for sustainable procurement is not there and there is a lack of update on user guides and manual. Next slide, please. These are the main recommendations that have been made by uh, the, uh, the MAPS assessment, which, he, which as you know, is, is done based on four pillars. First pillar is the legal, regulatory, and policy framework. 
The second pillar being the institutional framework and management capacity. The third one being acceptability, accountability, integrity, and transparency of public procurement system. And the fourth one being the public procurement operation and market practices. We have had a number of, uh, of recommendations, like for instance, the PPA requires a critical and comprehensive review. We need to review our law. We have to reduce the complexity of our legal framework and enhance compliance. We have to remove barriers to entry, as somebody rightly said, and uh, we need to come up with proper uh, user guides, and to, to mention a few of them, and to, uh, for instance, to roll out the EPS to see to it that the electronic procurement system is used extensively. And it is, for your information, uh, in the year 2020, 2021, the Minister of Finance announced that the use of electronic procurement system is mandatory, right? Next slide, please. We are proceeding. Uh, we have already uh, uh, appointed two uh, persons, two experts. One is to uh, prepare a TOR for the review of the legal framework. And the second one is to prepare a TOR for the review of the electronic procurement system, because our electronic procurement system dates back to 2015. And you would agree with me that uh, being an, a, a software, it needs a review or revamp or even replacement. So we are looking at that. We will very soon uh, do that. So when we are looking at our legal framework, we are going to identify and provide consolidated written recommendations, improve and update the public procurement legislation, incorporate in the new legislation development, which are reflected in existing supporting legal framework, including directives and circulars, and support and align with the government procurement specific and wider sustain sustainability agenda. In so doing, we will have, in, in, uh, in two years' time, Mauritius will have uh, embarked on the route towards sustainable public procurement because we'll have a full chapter on pu sustainable public procurement. After the comprehensive legal review, Mauritius will have a policy strategy in place to implement the sustainable public procurement in support of broader national policy objective. The sustainable public procurement implementation plan will be based on an in-depth assessment system and tools are in place to operationalize, facilitate, and monitor the application of SPP. The legal and regulatory framework will allow, will allow for sustainability, economic, environmental, and social criteria to be incorporated at all stages of procurement cycle. The legal provision will require a well-balanced application of sustainability criteria to ensure sustainable procurement in Mauritius. The, this being said, what, what I can tell you is that there is a lot of work ongoing for the time being in, uh, in uh, uh, climate change. And I think we have got a delegation already present in Dubai to, uh, to talk about uh, climate change, what are the actions that have been initiated. And uh, we will certainly, uh, as from the procurement perspective, we are going, of course, to align ourselves with whatever the decision the government takes we're going to align as a policy office. We're going to see to it that the policy measures are in place so that we can move quickly with sustainable procurement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Devin Singh. So I leave now the floor to our chair, Chair Mark and Chair Monier to start the discussion. Thank you so much for your contributions. This is so valuable. And as Jenny is here, I'm a uh, Jelly is here, I know. Her message is that green public procurement is not only for industrialized countries. And I couldn't stress more this important message. This was also the absolutely key message of the webinar of the International Trade Center in Geneva. This is not only for industrialized countries. At the same time, it's true that the wealthier economies should invest more according to their possibilities. And what surprised me really today is the statement of Chris Eukins. We know each other for decades. Chris, the US position on green public procurement hasn't always been like this. When I remember decades ago, the policy was public procurement is about market access, competition, money and nothing else. And 
how does this mindset change occur in the US to say that we are in favor of green public procurement? Is this really something new according to you or is it just more explicit than it was before? Chris, what do you think? It's a constant trajectory, Mark. The, the, the trajectory was mapped out in 2010 uh, by the General Service Administration in a report to President Obama um, for political reasons, silly political reasons. Some of them during the Obama administration, there was a falling off. And then during the Trump administration, we basically fell into the fell into a hole. And now in the Biden administration, the Biden administration has set the foundation in this first term for very ambitious um, progress along all fronts, except for this one issue of whether or not we would actually measure for each good and service, the greenhouse gas emissions, but everything else is being put in place for a second term. But if Trump is elected and Biden doesn't have a second term, we're likely to fall in the hole again. Thank you for that very, very honest appreciation of the situation, because this is very important also from a European position because there is a common statement of the European Union and the United States that we commonly want to foster green public procurement as a trade policy tool. I mean, this is spectacular. The problem is the broader public doesn't know about these things. And that's, I think our panel can help to make such things, let's say publicly known. Thank you so much, Chris. Turning to Monia, would you like to add something? I thought maybe I would just ask, I'm not a procurement expert, so I'm just going to ask a question that might be Please. Too, um, simplistic, but um, has any analysis been done on the uh, additional cost of incorporating sustainability into uh, procurement? Or, or is it expected that this is a cost neutral process? Just as a pure kind of question, because I know that a lot of procuring entities are also required to ensure they procure at least cost, and whether this is something that potentially is a slight adjustment of that particular criterion, or it's, the expectation is that actually you're just basically choosing the better winners rather than the more expensive ones. Is, if I could just throw in for the United States, if there's a if there's a regulatory action that has an impact of over $100 million, there has to be a, a cost benefit analysis done. Um, so that's likely to be done in parallel to these various regulatory initiatives I talked about. I do want to say, though, that something that's changed very significantly since the Obama administration is that a lot of the um, data gathering that's required to make this work the gathering regard the gathering of data regarding the greenhouse gas emissions uh, attributable especially to the larger public traded corporations in the United States that data gathering is going on anyway in the in the broader private marketplace so a cost benefit analysis would be muddied by the fact that a lot of these costs are being absorbed already by corporations just because they're participating in other markets in essence the federal government is free riding on work that's being done elsewhere Right. Yeah, I can. Uh, from can a European well. perspective, it may be added that the European public procurement directives are very, very, let's say, significant in a way that they want to change the paradigm from competition based on price to competition based on quality. So the European public procurement regulation says quality is more important compared to price than it has been before. And in Switzerland, this is even more clear because we changed the formula. What we want to have is the most advantageous tender getting the award, which makes clear that quality, including environmental features, is more important than money. And, and this direction, will be followed by the whole community sooner or later, according to me. But I'm very interested on the feedbacks, not only in the Netherlands applying the EU law, but also from other participants. Well, I can highlight that one a little bit. If I look at our contracts, we use, of course, uh, also best price quality uh, comparison. Uh, but if I look in general, I think 
within the commodities we have, we see that sustain, uh, sustainability means efficiency. And efficiency means that in general, uh, costs are lower because the products uh, last longer. So the total cost of ownership of products goes actually down while investing. Um, we don't see uh, price increases at all in our products, actually. If I look at it in a broader perspective, I can give details, of course. So actually, we see that uh, sustainability means actually lower total cost of ownership. So it's cheaper for it's it creates more value for taxpayers money. Um, and also, if we look at the things we require in our tenders, which sometimes require an investment, um, are combined with award criteria in such a way that it benefits, uh, compensates a little bit of a maybe higher cost or investments from their side. And what's really interesting, of course, the investments, if one a contract partner does some investments, which are always, uh, uh, we try to keep them as low as possible. Um, they also can use, of course, always for other um, assignments as well and other contracts as well. So it's, it's beneficial to see it. So we also make a clear distinguishment between uh, investments and costs because of those those are different things, uh, of course, also from a from a financial perspective. So in general, we see uh, that sustainable uh, sustainability equals efficiency and means lower costs for uh, for the government in, the, in general. So that's what I can say. I from see the perspective. Anne Claire Howard raising her hand. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was just going to come in on this because it's a, for me, it's a really interesting debate, especially within the UN system, where obviously it goes back to how you define value for money. Uh, and value for money tends to be, especially in cash constrained uh, entities or in governments that have, you know, limited public spending ability. It's that never ending balance of what's affordable versus what's best for, for your country. And I think that that goes back to having, and it's what I was saying in, in my introduction, it's around whether you view procurement as strategic or not, if it's simply just about buying the goods or services you need right now versus what you need for the future and what will have the most positive impact in the long run. Um, now, we've spoken about life cycle, uh, total cost of ownership, et cetera. The challenge with that is it's it's difficult. It's complicated. The methodologies are, are difficult to implement. And when you're dealing with governments that have challenges and don't necessarily have the personnel or the skills to, to do this. It's hard enough when you're sitting, you know, like I am in Copenhagen to do it for our own internal processes. But when you're sitting, you know, in a landlocked developing economy that has a very limited marketplace, very limited uh, suppliers, these things become highly com complicated and you're not dealing with savvy suppliers either. You know, as we were saying, you know, in the US, there's a market incentive. There are players who by law have to make a lot of progress in this space. There are government subsidies. There's there's a whole host of measures in place to support that. For us, we deal mostly, you know, 67% of the procurement we do is done in the country where projects are being implemented. So we're dealing with a very different supplier base than the ones you would have the luxury of having in, in the Western world. And there, the, the big element is exactly that. How do you define value for money for each procurement process, but also how do you work with suppliers to build their capacity to respond to the increasing demands that we place on them from a sustainability perspective? Uh, you know, it's great. There's I used to work in the steel industry. There's a lot of progress being done around green steel or at least low low carbon embodied steel but let's be realistic this steel is not going to make it to south sudan or somalia or to build infrastructure in these countries most of the production's already been bought by you know companies in in europe who want to be able to design green sustainable buildings and can afford the price premium that this will have initially. So it's it's really around how you balance these different considerations and how you, you tailor expectations. You know, green goods are not necessarily going to be the same when you're buying them in South Sudan than the ones you're buying in the Netherlands. And for me, it's really around how do you build into your processes these incremental step changes that allow you to bring the market along with you in, in these developing economies so that they can also start being more sustainable, which has a knock-on effect throughout the whole economy. So it's how you leverage the, the power that the government has to, to bring the private sector along with it and, and stimulate the private sector to just perform better. Thank you so much. We are running out of time. If we have questions from um, the participants, yes. So two things. First, just following up 
public performance typically doesn't take into account the externalized costs of production by the sellers, which then come back to affect the public. If you include those costs, then the you know, greener technologies may in fact be a lower cost option. Um, it's more cash up front, but you're not incurring the cost of the consequences that the businesses are externalizing. Governments need to start actually taking that into account. Second, and much more importantly, uh, there's an entire discussion going on in the access to medicines uh, context about conditionality of government procurement, uh, particularly assuring that you set in advance for uh, upfront R&D contracts and for purchasing contracts, the concept of affordability, the concept of distributed local manufacturing to assure that the prices are affordable and so that there is an affording of the kind that you just said of good clean steel rather than dirty steel for other countries. Why isn't conditionality being talked about in this kind of procurement context? Does anybody want to pick that one up? Yeah. Well, it sounds like a debate that we should be having, uh, but maybe not for this session right now. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Should we wrap up? Is we wrap right? up. We yeah. take note of that question <laughs> because it's actually a debate. Are you talking about the kind of carbon border adjustment mechanism there? So, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, well, it's only intended to ensure that uh, those countries do invest in exactly those, these sorts of things because then they'll have the competitive ability to import into the European Union. So I, I don't know whether it would be protectionist because the reality is it's meant to avoid the protectionism. So hopefully it's counter to what you're suggesting. But any other thoughts? May, may I add something to this debate? Because that's an important trade issue. Yeah. And what we discovered when discussing it was that import bans or adjustment mechanisms are including the private sector and the private market. And what we are doing is just nothing more than uttering public consumer preferences. It's nothing more than that. And that's why public procurement has a fantastic leeway and fantastic possibilities in the trade philosophy because it's not giving the rules for the private market, but making clear what the public sector consumer preferences are. And that's why it's beyond those border adjustment issues. And that's why public procurement is a fantastic lever to let those kind of questions open and to go forward in disregard of those discussions. That's the fantastic opportunity of public procurement. Thank you. Okay, so that's end our session. And I know that this is just the beginning of us working in procurement, really um, you know, promoting the procurement is not just an, a backdoor function, not an operation, but a strategic tool specifically on issues such as climate change. 
Actually, I, I, I can have some response to your question based on experience, but let's discuss it because I am not in the authority to discuss that issue on, on public. So anyway, thank you so much for all the, the participants. We have 22 on the line. And of course, this is something that we, we, we really look forward to people working in climate change. Just, just one note, people working in climate change. I reviewed all the NDC reporting of 194 countries only 10% of them had actually indicated that they're using public procurement as a tool to achieve their NDC. And this discussion is showing us that we can actually use procurement. So what is happening to the 90% reporting country? Why are they not considering procurement as a tool to achieve their NDC? And that's my question to people who are now in the cup. That's why we really want them to think about procurement. Thank you so much. Thank you.